Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be participating in this workshop. The Economic Research Service does um, research and statistics on U.S. agriculture, and we look broadly at programs for food, for natural resources, farms, and rural communities. And today I'm going to talk about research opportunity, you know, three topics. One, some research opportunities to look at how big data is influencing our food and ag system. And I'll build on what Rob talked about to look at issues around farm use of big data, the retail, and other parts of the system. Also talk about uses and applications in research, different types of data that we're using. I don't know what crosses a threshold into big data, but these are all largish data sets, and they're um, new, unstructured type of data, which I think brings in some applications and you, you know, thinking about the statistical properties that's common to big data. And then last, I'll conclude by um, discussing some of the public goods that are needed in order to broadly use these types of new data and roles for public sector agencies like the Economic Research Service. So let me start by start by figuring out how to move the page down. Rob, did you have a secret? <laughs> Oh, is that the? I don't actually know. Oh, yeah, you just have to scroll down. Okay. I will just scroll down. So I'm going to start by looking at research to assess the effects of big data on the food and egg system. And this is clearly selective, but give you some ideas about the things we're looking at and questions that you can ask. So it's interesting that we heard about the use of, um, wow, this is unfortunate. Yeah, someone better with technology than me, because you don't usually have problems with PDF files. Okay, right, let's do that. that. Thank you. Okay, well, this chart provides background for thinking about big data and farming in the United States. And it shows for a set of field crops the growth in the size of farms over recent decades, drawing on the census of agriculture. And what's reported in each of these sets of lines for commodities is the midpoint acre. And that's the acre at which half of the acres are in farms above this size acre and half are below. So if you look at the numbers, you can see the tremendous growth in recent years in the size of farm. And just briefly, we think this is a good measure because it, we have so many um, small farms in the U.S. that averages don't move over time. But this, instead of focusing on the farm, focuses on the acre of production. And, and you just, I think the bottom line is we have increasing concentration of production on larger operations, and technology and economies of scale are one of the key reasons. And the evidence shows that, is thinking about it, um, precision agriculture and these big data technologies are likely to be forces that will increase these pressures for concentration over time. So um, let me just start with an, the next chart showing how we can see the differences in adoption of these technologies. And this chart looks at corn. And we see on the left-hand side the percent of farms that are adopting a technology and the percent of acres using the technology. And the acres using it are larger, you know, implying that these are used more by larger farms. And I think this is really something you see across all the commodities where we've measured the use of precision agriculture. And one, I think, an interesting question for research is, will this be the technology that allows for the greater industrialization of agriculture. 
Um, even with this growth in farms, we've seen that most agriculture is carried out on operations owned by families. They may not be one operator. They may be, you know, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, parents, but they're generally held by families. And the thought is that, one, the specialized knowledge matters a lot. And two, you need to have these kinds of relationships because of the risk and difficulty in contracting for services in agriculture. Well, one hypothesis for research is that this technology might mitigate that kind of special knowledge and also provide the kind of benchmarks and um, assurances in terms of management and reporting back that would allow you to break down some of these trust barriers that have kept families um, engaged. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I think it's an interesting research hypothesis. Um, another aspect could be that um, we allow farmers to do different things because of big data availability in terms of um, being able to monitor what they're doing. So this is a chart looking at variable rate chemical um, applicators so that allow a farmer to adapt what's being applied based on the information coming from the field. And these can reduce cost and they can have environmental benefits by more finely targeting the needs, applying less um, fertilizers, applying less pesticides or herbicides. And if you look, they really haven't taken off yet in rice and corn farming. But there's some thought actually that it's sort of a big data cycle that availability of finer detailed information on pests and soils could make these kind of variable rate applicators more powerful by being able to better target and sort of raise the benefits um, that you get out of this. And you know, one app thought is that in addition to raising the benefits in terms of lowering the costs, they could create new markets for farmers to be able to sell more sustainable soybeans or more sustainable corn, rice, or cotton. There, it's easier to document that you're producing this with lower inputs. You've got the hard evidence coming out of the technology that can be documented. Um, this shows our data for cotton farms, and here, you see just a comparison of adoption over time um, on cotton farming where it's interesting the guidance systems which have this cost ability to drive down costs by you know more you know correctly steering not overlapping in the rows that you're planning or applying inputs to they've been adopted quickly but some of these other things like variable rate technologies are coming up in adoption, but slower rates. So I think there's a lot of interesting research questions, and we have some data that you can use through the Agricultural Resource Management Survey we conduct with NAS around this issue of the structure of farm, but also the kinds of businesses and even implications and spillovers to environmental policies that could occur down the road. Okay, so I think this isn't limited in terms of its implications on the farming side. This could really reshape the whole value chain. And I'm not sure I call it big data, but it's IT, the availability of the internet, on the one hand, and this is on the left-hand side, can create opportunities for small farms to market their products directly to consumers. You gotta have some attributes here at sustainable agriculture, but I was recently in Italy and heard that the Italian wine sector is increasingly selling directly to importers and consumers around the world via the internet. And it's allowing some of the smaller producers to remain more profitable. So anecdotal, but I think, you know, that's one hand, it isn't data for research, but a, a use of data, could be some research. And then on the other side is sort of the, high tech, um, how firms are using um, scanners, are using um, cameras, sensors to uh, monitor shoppers, and supermarkets can better arrange their material, market it so that we buy the more profitable items. So this is an image of cameras in a store, and in some stores they follow you around, they track your eye movements, they, you know, learn from this about how to be more profitable. So clearly I think there's scale economies, not, not necessarily in the cameras, they're pretty cheap, but in the know-how and ability to use this information and then apply it within your retail environment. 
And actually at the Economic Research Service, we're sponsoring research that tries to use these new technologies to develop strategies to encourage shoppers, especially low-income Americans, participating in USDA's nutrition programs to buy healthier foods. So there's, I think, a policy implication, but in terms of the structure of the food and ag industry, in general, these technologies seem to be things that require fixed upfront investments and certainly investments in know-how and ongoing um, analytical capabilities to apply them. So a good research agenda. Um, let me next talk about what we're doing in terms of questions we're already asking at the Economic Research Service and using these new types of data to increase the power of what we can do. And I'll say a lot of this we make available. Um, if you're interested in any of this, don't hesitate to follow up with me afterwards. We do see ourselves as providing public goods to the profession for research. And I'm going to talk about two um, big dimensions we've made a large investment in. One is administrative data, and one is scanner data from retail grocery stores. So administrative data is kind of an inside the beltway Washington term. What it means is program data. So when you participate in the SNAP program, you get a benefit card, and how much those benefits are, and some of your characteristics are what we would captured by the program. If you're part of a farm program, the same thing. Well, administrative data is a generic term we use to talk about this pro these data that comes from administering programs. Um, they're really, in, and they're becoming increasingly available. There's a push for open government that is driving this, um, and also just cost. This is a source of data that isn't free, but it doesn't require going out and contacting people to collect additional information. Um, and what I mean by isn't free is you need to invest in it to make it usable and understandable. So a strength of this is it's complete. Unlike a survey that goes to a part of the population, you get all the participants in the program. Um, it's reliable in that for the variables about the program, it's got good, hard data, not what someone says. Um, about the program and whether they participated. For example, it's known that when you ask people if they're participating in SNAP or food stamps, the responses are lower than actual participation. Um, I think this is a common thing. When you ask people about their weight, they report that they're not as heavy as they actually are. Um, so there, there's a reliability there. But there's a limitation for research on programs in that the data omit non-participants, and they have a limited set of variables. Even if they ask demographic questions, the incentives aren't there for people out in the field administering programs to really provide high-quality responses. So one thing we've been doing at the Economic Research Service is linking administrative data to survey data. And that way, we increase the accuracy of the data about programs in surveys and we also get the non-participants. I'll just briefly mention why I think one of our um, biggest and so far I think high payoff projects is that we're working in partnership with the Census Bureau, the Food and Nutrition Service that administers the SNAP program, and our agency to link states' administrative data to census surveys. And, I don't want to get too down in the weeds, but for many f what you think of as federal programs, there are money given to states that administer these programs. So when you need to collect the data about the programs, you have to go to the states. They technically own this data. And so we're working with the Census Bureau on a state-by-state -state basis to collect this data link it to um, the American Community Survey, a very large nationally representative survey, and then conduct research using the data on a set of questions of interest to policymakers. And these include who participates in food assistance programs. Here we can um, overcome some of these reporting biases. We can get down to more county or congressional district information that you can't get from the program data. And then we can also look at how it affects people's lives, link this participation to outcomes such as a measure of food security, and 
really we have grand ambitions to link this further to health surveys such as the, that come from the National Institute of Health Statistics. And we can also then understand better about who participates and why they do or don't. This allows the program agency to better target their resources. So this is, I think, a really interesting project. We've got reports published on New York and Texas. You can find on our website. And more and more states are joining in this initiative. A second resource that we have is retail scanner data. ERS has been purchasing research retail scanner data for a decade um, and using it for research on food markets and um, also on diet and obesity. It's been a real resource because we've been able to link this data to data that's uh, maintained by the Agricultural Research Service on the nutrient content of foods. And that's something that we're continuing to invest in. Um, I think also something that this brings up is an interesting application where the, this kind of data can give you more finer geographic or person type detail. You know, surveys, because of their cost, and you can only get down to certain geography or certain amount of information, like about how many foods. You're not going to ask people, do they, a 10,000 list of foods that they might buy or eat away from home. But you can get that and match it to these bigger surveys, ground truth it, and get into this more, de more detail that's valued. But there's challenges. You know, what's in these surveys? What's the coverage? What's the representativeness? And something I'd also put on the table is, how does that change over time? These private companies aren't bound by the practices of a statistical agency to have a common reference point to do representative sampling so that you can trace the impacts over time and have good monitoring. These companies can change how they measure. Stores go in and out. Whole chains go in and out of the data of the system. And so that's a real challenge. They may take some products in and out because we're a byproduct. They're actually producing this for um, food companies and retail stores. And if they don't have the demand from that side, they're not going to produce it. But having said all those things, it's still a great resource. And there are ways to make it stronger. And at the Economic Research Service, we see one of our roles also as investing in documenting the quality, the strengths, and weaknesses of this data. And then also convening forums of researchers using the data to share their experiences. So we build a community and we better understand the properties of this resource over time. Um, in the retail, just in one reference, looking down at my notes, in this data that we purchase on an annual basis, there are 6.5 billion observations per year. So, I mean, this isn't big data in the sense of sensor data or NASA type data, but it is the biggest data we have. And I will say it does also pose some IT challenges for our system. It's pushed us to learn and do some new things as we accumulate this data, but I, I won't go into those issues today. But I think it also creates some incentives for doing things together. Um, a final challenge I'll mention before concluding is that you also have to find ways to turn proprietary data into public goods. Um, we share this with researchers in a re constrained environment that meets our contractual arrangements with the providers, but we also turn it into public goods by um, working with other USD agencies to put this data into their tools, such as MyPlate, um, the dietary guidelines, and then publishing our own reports that use this data. And then I think one final example is we use it in combination with our survey on food behavior food apps to give a richer set of information about what Americans eat. So let me conclude by talking about some research and public goods to support the use of big data. I'll go through quickly. Um, knowing the details of research isn't my strength either. So I think one thing is we've got some research we could do in our profession and is being done more broadly on new methods to fit models using machine learning, allowing the data itself to identify the relationships that um, you can observe. Um, it's not going to work for every problem, but I, you know, more tools are better. Also developing methods to apply machine learning to um, causal inference. 
This is uh, one thing you hear pointed out is that, you know, these unstructured model methods don't tell you the links between the variables and what's driving the outcome, but there is research being done um, using, you know, to try and overcome this and brings causality into it. This figure shows a causal tree which automatically selects subgroups for heterogeneous treatment effect estimation, and it's from Athi and Imben, so one of our speakers later today. Um, we've also got, I think, a way in terms of um, roles for the public sector and for all of us potentially, we need some public goods about linking and curating this data so it's accessible, we can use it over time, and we can understand the properties. Here are just examples of data that comes from a field, maybe the NASA data, data you might get from people's use of the smartphone, or I have my you know, wristband tracking my steps. Those could provide data for research. And then trading data, and Rob's talked about some of this already. Um, so I think this, for our, me and I, my colleagues at the Economic Research Service, as well as across the federal statistical system, we're thinking about the kinds of public goods and how this big data or new types of data can influence what we do. And I mentioned a few here. Um, maybe there's some opportunities for common acquisition and curation of data. I'd point to the scanner data as a way we're going down that road. Um, similarly, we need to invest in re research on the quality and properties of alternative data sources. And Rob's provided an example of that for the yield data that might exist. And then I think there's also something I haven't talked about, but if we're going to use this data over time and it's unstructured data, we might need to bring some structure to it, common identifiers in terms of how we might think about firms or businesses in the data, or some terms that we use so that we're speaking the same language to some degree. And then I think we should be looking over the horizon. There's a lot of exciting opportunities in sensors. I think there's some work being done on how sensors might help us better understand the links between dietary choices and health. And drones or UAVs are really, you know, just with the recent legislation, there's a lot more use of them. And you think about a spatial context for agriculture, that could really change both production and opportunities for um, documenting things like environmental services. And then last, I'm an optimistic person, but I want to end with kind of a cautionary note, is, you know, nothing's ever a windfall or a panacea. And I think, I hope I've made the case that this is a tremendous opportunity and tool, but we're going to have to invest and invest real dollars, time and energy, and understanding the properties investing in, you know, the, how we can use them, new technology, new research methods, new ways of storing the data. And it's not a panacea. It's not going to solve all questions. But, you know, I am an optimist, and I think I've already seen in our agency a lot of questions we're able to answer because of this better access to data and that the investments so far where we've made it have really had a payoff. So thank you very much.